So let's talk about a case where some companies made some big bets based on a forecast and see how it's working out for them. In the late 1990s, uh, Boeing and Airbus were contemplating the possibility of a super jumbo. That would be an airplane that was bigger than the humpback 747. This was a key decision for both firms, Airbus, because they didn't have an airplane that competed with the 747, and a super jumbo would give them a new high-tech entrant into that market that would certainly gather a lot of sales. For Boeing, it was a big deal because there's a question of how big is this market really, and they knew that if they built a super jumbo, it was going to cannibalize sales of the 747, basically bring production of the 747 to an end. <clears throat> and so both of these companies are looking at this market. Believe it or not, at one point, they even discussed doing the airplane as a joint venture, which in a highly uncertain environment is actually a good way to mitigate the risk. But if you know these two companies, they hate each other, and so that was not going to work. After the joint venture dissolved, Airbus came out and said, yes, we're going to go ahead with the Super Jumbo, and that's what you see on the left of your screen that became the A380. This left Boeing with a key decision to make. Do we launch our own Super Jumbo, understanding it's going to cannibalize the 747, Understanding that we're going to, in essence, split the market with Airbus because that's just the nature of it. They both get good market share, whether it's 51 49, 60 40, really not seldom more than like a 60 40 split. So, what do we do? And this is where you get into forecasting as they began to look at the world, how the world was changing, look at their customer base, talk to their airlines. They be, uh, became uh, convinced that the market was not in a yes efficient but very large airplane that would go between major hubs, for example, from Los Angeles International to Tokyo. They became convinced that an airplane that served what they call long, thin markets, so for example, San Diego direct to Shanghai, San Diego direct to Sapporo, San Diego to Okinawa, so secondary cities in some of the uh, Asian markets would actually be more desired by the airlines. So they made that fateful decision to forego launching a Super Jumbo, which is a big, big deal. If their forecast was wrong and the Super Jumbo sold well for Airbus, in other words, if it's A380 sold well, this was going to be a huge missed profit opportunity for Boeing and frankly going to put them at, at a disadvantage for decades as they're going to have to try to scramble and bring a product to market later and understand all the problems with that. So instead of doing a Super Jumbo, the Boeing did the airplane that's pictured on the right of the screen the Boeing 787. Now we know um, 10 years after the product launch that Boeing did a terrible job bringing this airplane to market and we'll talk about this some more later in class as some bad example of how not to do things in terms of executing on the design but just based on the announcement the 787 was the fastest selling pre-production airplane ever. They sold almost a thousand airplanes before the airplane ever flew for the first time. Contrast that with the A380, which is lagging way behind on sales. So at this point, and I want to emphasize that caveat, at this point, it looks like Boeing's forecast was correct. The market for the Super Jumbo was not as big as what Airbus thought it was, certainly not big enough to support two manufacturers. And this idea of the long, thin market, the twin jet, smaller, super fuel efficient airplane, was going to better match the needs of the market. We'll see over the next 10 years or so whether those fates reverse and the A380 becomes a little bit more popular airplane. So we can make fun of forecasts, but sometimes companies just have to make decisions based on their analysis and the stakes are extremely high. Let's wrap up uh, this discussion. Now let's talk specifically about Porter's, Porter Spy Forces, which I've told you is deeply rooted in the industrial organizational view of competitive advantage. So they're first of all, Pick a good industry. Industries vary. That's certainly something you should pick up from Porter's article. They have different profitability, and that's important. But then within that industry, you want to pick a strong position. Now, there's a little bit of an irony here. <clears throat> You've read Porter's What is Strategy article, and now is Porter's Five Forces Updated article. And if you read them carefully, Michael Porter, who is brilliant and one of the foremost uh, thinkers on competitive strategies, can be a little bit anti-competitive. Because in essence, what does he tell companies to do? Find a position where nobody else is, reinforce it, and he kind of tells companies, don't attack one another. That's bad competition. The only good time of co type of competition from an industry perspective is one that grows the pie. Fighting over uh, the same sh share of pie, so to speak, not what Porter would recommend leads to overall industry profitability. But you want to pick a strong position, and then you want to perhaps strengthen that position by manipulating those five forces 
And that's something I really want you to think about. How do companies manipulate those five forces to try to improve their position? Overall takeaways, you're not in this alone. You have to pay attention to the external analysis. Andy Grove had it exactly right. Only the paranoid can survive. Now, some companies say, well, we don't pay attention to our competitors because we're a pace setter. I don't, I don't buy it for a minute. Um, in fact, you can read the rest of the slide as the sum up, but I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to make a forecast, and I've never been wrong on this forecast yet. In the business strategy game, the teams that finish at the very bottom of the, of the, uh, the industry are going to be the ones that did the worst job about anticipating the moves of their competitors and forecasting what was going to be the right strategy to, to, uh, to thrive in that environment based on what their competitors are doing. So very important to pay attention to what goes on outside the firm. Um, we're going to link this with what happens inside the firm in the next uh, week's study to come up with an idea of how do we bring this analysis to an end and actually make some decisions. Look forward to our interaction.